Hello and welcome to Farm Connections. I'm your host, Dan Hoffman. On today's episode, we get ready for the harvest with Patrick O'Connor in Blooming Prairie. Kent TC provides insight into the 2018 Market Facilitation Program, and we join Ryan Miller at the University of Minnesota Extension's Crop Production Day, all here today on Farm Connections. Welcome to Farm Connections with your host, Dan Hoffman. Farm Connections, sponsored by Alcorn Clean Fuel, a farmer-owned cooperative in Claremont, Minnesota, produces ethanol, high-protein livestock feed, and corn oil, and beverage-grade carbon dioxide for resale to benefit its members and their communities. Absolute Energy, a locally owned facility, produces 115 million gallons of ethanol annually. Proudly supporting local economies in Iowa and Minnesota. Absolute Energy, adding value to the neighborhood. Southern Minnesota Center for Agriculture, promoting education and careers in agriculture. Connecting students with college, curriculum and industry resources to develop, fill and sustain jobs with agriculture in our region. We're in Blooming Prairie, Minnesota on the O'Connor Farm, and we're here to learn a little bit more about how the harvest or the crop gets from the field into the bin site and then into the marketplace. And along with that is Patrick O'Connor. Patrick, thanks for joining us on Farm Connections. It's no problem. <laughs> Patrick, you've got a big job ahead of you, getting ready for a big harvest, and we're blessed to have a big harvest, but tell us how you do that. Well, my. My job here is the, I'm, I manage the day-to-day -day operation of the farm. Um, and basically what that means is I need to make sure that all our work is done timely and efficiently. So whenever, whenever the harvest is ready, I need to be ready. All the machinery needs to be serviced and ready to go. So then whenever, that, whenever Mother Nature gives us that window of opportunity to harvest our crop, we're in the field instead of working on equipment. So basically what that means is um, in amongst all the other activities of hauling grain, um, tending to the growing crop, things like that, I spend a lot of time in the farm shop working on, working on equipment and preparing. It's, it's uh, mon months of pre preparation that go into having a smooth, well-run harvest. Well, it certainly looks like you have a huge investment and I, I kind of think of this shop and the open door out in front of the combine as kind of like the launching pad. So when you are ready to go, what happens then? When, when we're ready to go, we'll, uh, we'll go to the field and we'll, we'll see how I did in the shop. We'll, we'll make sure that everything is run properly. And then um, for soybeans, we, we use two combines and we just we start harvesting our, our soybeans. And it's... Uh, it's a four or five man show to, to get, get that done properly. A four or five person job to get the harvest in. I remember listening to someone that just sat in a combine for probably about three minutes watching the reel turn and bringing the soybeans in and pretty soon it happened to be a, a lady. Uh, she said, wow, uh, this is a lot of work. Well, three minutes isn't anything like what happens for you. How long does the harvest take? Well, our, our goal is to uh, have everything wrapped up in, say, five weeks. But, you know, you have, you have weather issues. You, you might have mechanical issues that all come into that. And the thing about Minnesota is, whether we like it or not, winter is coming. So we need to make sure that when it's time to get our crops out, we get them out. Otherwise, winter might come, and then we have a real big issue on our hands. Patrick. Your part of getting the machinery ready is important for protecting the investment, but also getting through that five to six week time period. Walk us through some of the systems you work with, like hydraulics, fuel system, electrical, diagnostics, global positioning technology, air filter, air pressure in the tires. What, what all do you have to do? Well, as you mentioned, Dan, combines are very complex machines. They're the most expensive piece of equipment that we have, and they they're incredibly complex machines that we need to we need to first understand how they work so then we can identify issues as they come along because no matter what we are going to have some sort of issue so 
Um, what, what I try to do in the shop is go through the machine with a fine tooth comb. That's looking, looking at any electrical issues that may be present, um, making sure that it's clean, it's serviced, the oil is changed, it's ready to go and just trying to find any issues before they become a bigger problem. Because the, pro the problem is once we go to the field, we want, we want to get as much done as possible. Because if a combine is broke down, then I mentioned it, it's four or five guys. Well, all of a sudden we're stopped. And those guys, they're not, they're not doing anything. They're not being productive. So we want to keep the crop coming in at all times. So now you're adding another layer of complication. Not only all those systems and the maintenance, but now you've moved to the field, you're managing people. But what about weather conditions and crop conditions? Do you keep the settings on the combine the same for everything? No, it's, it's constantly changing. It changes, it changes by the hour, really. I mean, these combines are set up where we can, we can make uh, minor adjustments while we're going down the field. We don't even have to stop to to change our adjustments and it it can be it can be as simple as we're just in a different area of a field um, it can be different varieties of corn or soybeans that harvest differently and ultimately the combine the combine's job is to get that crop in the tank in in the bin and ultimately to market well the person operating the machine needs to understand that small adjustments can make a big difference. If we're, if we're throwing soybeans or corn out the back of the combine, that doesn't do anybody any good. So Patrick, to help you do that, you've got some technology here. Can you describe some of those technological systems and how you use them to get the harvest? Absolutely. Um, our combines are, are equipped with uh, GPS, Global Positioning Systems. Uh, they both have auto steer and um, real-time yield mapping. So we can see as we're going along the field what the, what the yield is for this particular area. So th those yield maps come back to us in the, in the winter so we can look at how our field did and try to address any problems. Furthermore, um, each combine is equipped with grain loss monitors and a whole variety of sensors that help us help us identify any problems that are happening with the machine so we can address them quickly before they become a bigger issue. Patrick, you mentioned GPS or Global Positioning System. How can we find out where that combine is in the field or where it is on the earth? How does that work? Well, Dan, these, these combines and most, most pieces of modern farm equipment are connected to satellites. And the reason for that is, number one, it, it knows exactly where it's at within the field, and that helps us for yield mapping. Mm -hmm. And also, it allows us to have auto steer systems on our machinery. Basically, the combine, when it's set, will drive itself in a straight line throughout the field. Um, what that does is it allows the operator to focus on the head and the crop coming into it rather than trying to steer and adjust his, his line to make sure he's taking a full swath at every pass. It in increases our productivity and it reduces the operator fatigue all at the same time because we're, we're able to focus on the job at hand instead of just driving. Patrick, you, you referenced GPS and also those yield maps and how important they are. What do you use them for? Well, the, the yield maps are a very important decision-making tool that we have on our farm. Um, every, every field gets mapped out so we see how, how this year's crop performed in each area of the field. Is that, you'll, in, each, in each field, you'll have higher performing areas and lower performing areas. What we can do is pick out these areas and treat them differently. Um, so the areas of the field that they really, they really perform well, they make lots of bushels, we can treat that differently. We can try to drive it more, put more nutrients out there, more seed, more fertilizer. So then that area is taken care of, and then we can maybe take it from the other areas of the field that don't perform as well. Maybe it's just a soil type issue. And that way we can, we can shift our nutrients from 
the, the poor performing areas to the best soil and be more efficient with everything we apply to our field. Patrick, this is really interesting and thank you for helping our audience understand the complications and the difficulties and all the challenges of getting that crop in. This is very, very important for all of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dan. Stay tuned for more on Farm Connections. Hi, this is Kent TC. In August of 2018, USDA authorized up to $12 billion in a tariff aid package to farmers and in order to offset uh, the financial losses from the current trade wars and tariffs uh, involved with China, Mexico, Canada, and other countries. Uh, part of the payments are direct payments to farmers, also purchases of commodities that are affected by the tariffs, and dollars to support future trade negotiations. Uh, the largest amount of the aid package is in the form of direct payments to farmers that will be paid under the Market Facilitation Program, or MFP. The program will be administered under the USDA Commodity Credit Corporation through local farm service agency offices. Sign up for the program began in September of this year and will continue through January of 2019. Uh, the applications can either be made in person at FSA offices or through online, a uh, very simple process, a one-page application form. Crop producers uh, can apply once they've completed their 2018 harvest for corn, soybeans, and other crops, uh, and they can verify their production. They do not need to provide the verified production information at the time of application, but need the information available for spot checks at a later time. The payment rates for crops are $1.65 per bushel for soybeans, one cent per bushel for corn, 14 cents per bushel for wheat, 86 cents per bushel for sorghum, and six cents per pound for cotton. Livestock producers are also eligible. Dairy producers are eligible for 12 cents per hundredweight based on their historical milk production. This is the same production that's been reported to FSA for the Market Price Protection Program. Hog producers are also eligible for $8 per head payment. This will be based on the number of hogs they had available on August 1st. Uh, this includes breeding hogs, nursery hogs, and finishing hogs. Uh, the MFP application form is available uh, on a website, www.farmers.gov slash MFP. The agricultural trade agreements that we currently have took decades to develop. Farm organizations and commodity groups spent millions of dollars of resources in financial and personal resources uh, to develop these agreements. While most farmers appreciate the aid package being offered by USDA, <clears throat> Most farm operators would like to see continued enhanced trade relations with the, our current trading partners, as well as new export markets open up to allow for future viability and future farm profitability. This has been Kent TC, and we'll be back next time with another report. We're at the Kiter Seed Day near Clarks Grove, Minnesota, sponsored by the University of Minnesota and others. And with me is Ryan Miller from the University of Minnesota, an Ag Extension Educator. Ryan, welcome to Farm Connections. Thanks, Dan. Ryan, you actually had a very wonderful event today with lots of partners and lots of cooperation. Tell us about it, would you please? Yeah, so it's actually, the event here has got a 47 year history, so that uh, precedes my tenure with the University of Minnesota Extension. but. Uh, it started way back when, when uh, 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 Keith and his father were, were doing some seed sales here on their farm. And since then, it's kind of moved uh, away from that. And uh, it's a co-sponsored event with Riverland Farm Business Management and University of Minnesota Extension. And uh, it's kind of a unique experience because we get to merge crop production, educational topics with kind of the farm business management side of things and, and economics. And so 
usually when someone has a meeting or, or an event, it's it's related to farm business management or it's related to uh, agronomy and crop uh, pest management and things like that. And so at this event, we kind of merge both those worlds together and gives us an opportunity to talk about things that are on everyone's mind in terms of uh, being kind of time sensitive with what happened this year in the field with, uh, with what we're experiencing, as well as what are the current uh, economic forces at play and, and what should people be thinking about as they move forward into making crop management decisions into, uh, into the oncoming crop year. So, Excellent. And the farmers, they have to balance all of that. They have to take the business aspect, the economic aspect, the agronomy aspect, the environmental aspect. So this is very helpful and you're taking your research from plots or from small spots or remote spots and bringing it to here for them. Is, is that how you do it? Yeah, so we end up being kind of a conglomeration of on-farm research and some of our small plot research and kind of cover management topics and try to provide some, some insight so that they can make the best decisions and so that, you know, they're not, you know, so they're informed and so then economically they're going to be a little bit better off because they're uh, going to invest in things that'll pay, and maybe forgo some things where they they could go uh, save some money. And, and particularly given uh, kind of economic climate with farming, it's it's a it's a good opportunity because then they can make the wisest choices and mm -hmm. it can really benefit their bottom line um, for the current crop year. Well, and what a neat opportunity. You've brought extension educators here. We've got farm business management instructors from Riverland Community College. What a great place to have one-on-one -on -one conversations in addition to the group. I'm sure the farmers make good use of it. Yeah, that's right. You know, that you have the educational speakers and then, you know, after you're done speaking, typically you'll get to meet with a handful of guys and even field some phone calls later, you know, following up. Like, I want to really do uh, whatever you were talking about, whatever practice it happened to be. and. And so it gives them a chance to kind of pick your brain a little bit and then also kind of get some kind of sense of certainty when they uh, finally do make some decisions with regards to something we were, we were addressing. So, Ryan, your specialty is crops. Tell us about your research. So we do a lot of uh, agronomic research. Uh, you know, we've, we've focused our, our uh, research site in Rochester is really focused in on a crop pest management and particularly our focus has, has really shifted or focused on uh, weed management in recent years uh, because there's a lot of questions in, in regards to weeds. You know, we haven't really seen new crop production uh, chemicals come to market. We've gotten some new uh, products, but these are older chemistries. And so uh, it's really been quite a long time since we've seen a really, truly new technology. And so what we're struggling with now is the advent of, of wider spread uh, herbicide resistance and so we're trying to uh, look at strategies to manage uh, weeds to both prevent herbicide resistance as well as manage it once it's it's here and so our focus is really kind of uh, shifted into that uh, into that world and, and trying to, to understand how we might best utilize the options we've got right now. Well, I think you just described why we need continual research, not just once and done. Things change. Our environment changes, our, our products change, and our crops change. What else are we looking at inside of that research? We, we do some educational programming, and during the course of that, we uh, end up uh, surveying growers what some of their, their biggest issues are, and then try to address that with, with you know, answering questions with some small plot or on-farm research. And, and if we drive around now uh, in fall, we can see uh, uh, in soybean fields in particular, the water hemp is starting to poke through where people weren't able to manage it entirely. And, and so um, we see issues with that. And so we've been looking at ways to deal with that, given the fact that uh, water hemp itself uh, is, is a very diverse weed. And so it has it has, uh, because of that diversity, it's, it's got great potential to overcome herbicides. So if we're managing with a set herbicide program for a number of years, eventually it's going to find a way around it. And so um, we've been looking at strategies to manage that once it's here, as well as look at strategies that might be more robust in terms of helping to prevent it. The uh, uh, layered herbicide approach where we're layering residual herbicides uh, into the end of the year so that we essentially are preventing that water hemp from germinating. You know, it's kind of a preventative approach. We just lay one residual on top of another. We did a, quite a bit of work with that a couple of years ago, uh, to try and determine when the best timing would be. So if we start with a pre-emergent herbicide, 
uh, when is the best timing in terms of laying another residual herbicide over the top. We kind of came up with the 20 to 30 day range, you know, 30 being optimal, but if you exceed 30, that's, you know, you're going to start to see water hemp emerge. And so that was one strategy we looked at. We're actually kind of coming back to some really old technologies. Cultivation, uh, you know, it's a relatively old technology. Uh, speaking, you know, a lot of people have forgotten about the cultivators or in the, the tree line and got weeds growing through them. But uh, actually, believe it or not, with the advent of some of the guidance technology we're using nowadays, it's gotten easier to use in a row crop cultivation. It's made it a little faster and more accurate in terms of uh, crop health, so you're less likely to cause uh, cultivator blight, as we call it. And so uh, we've started to look at that as maybe a potential tool to add back into the into the arsenal with weed management because it's kind of been forgotten with the advent of herbicides. Fully realizing we're still going to be utilizing herbicides um, in our in our uh, farm systems, but you know we got to have to start looking outside the box in terms of uh, uh, looking past herbicides what other things we're going to do so that's some work we've been doing with cultivation and has some pretty interesting results with that um, you know some of the other things we talk about is, is this zero weed threshold so getting out there and hand roguing plants when you see them in the in the crop and and that can be hugely beneficial because you take a weed like water hemp and uh, you know, when it's growing in the crop, it can it can easily produce 250,000 seeds. And so you think about that in the long run, that's going to be a 250,000 new weed problems in the future. And so uh, hand roguing is something we talk about. We address uh, 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 during harvest time, avoiding weed patches. And we've done a lot of that work. We've also looked at some of the newer herbicide resistance packages that are actually in the crops and, and, and had a chance to kind of experiment with that on a small scale. So then when a farmer sees some of our results, they can kind of predict how it's going to scale up to their farm and what might make them most successful given their farm, their limitations, and their logistical situation in terms of getting things done. And so it gives us a chance to experiment at a small scale and then, you know, gives them some, some certainty when they scale up to a bigger farm uh, that they'll have some success. So. Well, Ryan, we have a hungry world depending on you as well as our farmers. Thank you for the work you do. Thanks, Dan. Stay tuned for more on Farm Connections. Nicollet County farmer Dan Kaufman is a believer in cover crops. For the past several years, Kaufman has experimented seeding crops like cereal rye, turnips, and radishes in between rows of his corn and soybean crops. The plants are seeded while cash crops are growing. After the corn and soybeans are harvested, their cover crops capture the sunlight to grow until winter. Having continuous live roots in the ground contributes to nutrient sequestration, reduced compaction, and better overall soil health. We've proven it to ourselves, you know, in the past three years here. So now it's basically to scale it up. You know, it's just kind of been experimenting so we don't, you know, break the bank or break the farm on a new practice. But uh, we've saw it work, we've proved it, we're gonna keep doing it. Kaufman has experimented with several different pieces of equipment and seeding processes to get the process of establishing cover crops just right. He's currently working on a project to inject manure in his strip-till system. Kaufman has been supported in his efforts by the Minnesota Corn Growers and their Innovation Grant Program. Our innovation grants have, have always been really about helping control nitrogen loss from fields. And one of the things that cover crops do is they sequester that nitrogen. So in a field day like this, where we're looking at things that benefit a watershed like Seven Mile Creek, cover cropping systems have really been widely adopted in terms of keeping that soil in place and keeping that nitrogen in the field and bound up in those cover crops as well as the crop during the season and out throughout the winter as well. Kaufman says a lot of farmers are skeptical that cover crops can work in their area, but his research says otherwise. Kaufman is happy with the yields he's getting on his farm. He also knows there's a longer term reason he's focusing on cover crops and soil health. So basically trying to sustain our soil, or actually now the new thing is basically not sustain but regenerate. You know, um, I have uh, three children at home and you know hopefully one day one of those kids would like to farm so to pass the land off to them in as good or better shape than what I have it now. This is Lynn Kettleson reporting.
Success is built on two things, perseverance and preparation. Remaining informed and staying proactive helps to ensure that when the light goes green, you are ready to roll. I'm Dan Hoffman. Thank you for joining us today on Farm Connections.